This video is part of an audiobook series featuring Europe, The Strange Death of Europe, Immigration, Identity, and Islam by Douglas Murray in 2017. For more audiobooks, please visit my YouTube channel, find me on Spotify, or check out my website for downloads. Chapter 11 The Pretense of Repatriation in 1795, Immanuel Kant wrote of, of his preference for states over universal monarchy. For as he recognized, the wider the sphere of their jurisdiction, the more laws lose in force. In soulless despotism, when it has choked the seeds of good, at last sinks into anarchy. This view was not shared by the politicians who ruled Europe over the last quarter of a century. Borders, proclaimed the European Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker in August of 2016, borders are the worst invention ever made by politicians. If, if it was at least arguable whether politicians had actually invented borders, by the time Juncker made this statement, it was obvious that politicians were certainly able to make borders disappear. In 2015, when Angela Merkel opened a door that was already ajar, the arrangements within the continent certainly, fav certainly favored the views of Juncker over those of Kant. Anybody coming into Europe during that year would discover that once inside Europe, there were no more borders. From 1995 onwards, 26 countries signed up to the Schengen Agreement that created a border-free zone. From Portugal, Spain, Italy, and Greece, all the way in the south, all the way up to Sweden, Finland, and Estonia in the north by way of Hungary, Slovakia, Austria, France, and the Netherlands, this agreement made meant that more than 400 million people within Europe had the right to move freely across the continent without ever having to show a passport. One condition was that the member countries had common responsibility for policing the external borders, but... Otherwise, with the exception of the United Kingdom and five other smaller EU states, which refused to, to involve themselves in the treaty, the continent became from 1995 onwards one vast borderless zone. It was a dream of European harmonization and integration. But the Schengen Agreement was intended to augur a new era of peace and unity. It seemed hard to imagine the disadvantages of such free and unrestricted movement of people, goods, services, and capital. It was good for trade, and it was good for a Frenchman who wanted to go to Brussels for the evening. Whatever the downsides, the Schengen Agreement was not just about the practical ease of travel that it ushered in, but about the message it gave out. If ever there was a continent whose population could be persuaded that borders were the problem, it would be Europe. One interpretation of the 20th century is that twice in just 25 years the whole continent had gone to war over borders. In 1914 and again in the 1930s, the issue of borders had heralded the catastrophe of a continent. If these conflicts in which Europe twice lost a generation of its young men had indeed been caused by the existence of borders, then who would not wish to abolish them? In the same way that if the nation state is the cause of war, then who would not get, wish to get rid of the nation state? Among the flaws in this argument are the misguided ideas that borders, rather than German militarism, caused the First World War, among a range of many other complex factors, and that anything but Nazi aggression was responsible for the second. It might be convenient for some, not least some Germans, to adopt alternative explanations, but blaming borders for the war of the 20th century is like blaming cars for all traffic accidents. If borders can sometimes cause conflict, it does not follow that without borders the world would be without conflict. After all, before the wars of the nation-states in Europe, the continent was racked by wars of religion. But the flaws in the Schengen Agreement lay not only in the presumptions it made about history. The terrible flaw in Schengen was the way in which its principles were practiced. For instance, although member states committed to cooperate in policing the outside borders of the continent, the, in reality the task was left to the frontline states. Throughout the late 1990s and 2000s, Italy, Spain, and Greece were abandoned to deal with the inflow alone. Even after the creation of the EU border force Frontex in 2004, the southern states continued to bear the burden. As an exasperated Italian interior minister, Angelino Alfano had to remind his counterparts during the Lampedusa crisis in 2014, quote, said the, the Mediterranean border is a European border, end quote. But it was not only the burden of policing the borders of the whole continent that stretched the Mediterranean countries during this period. There were also the three, to date, 
iterations of the Dublin Regulation on Asylum, the EU-wide agreement that was instituted from the 1990s onward. The aim of the several versions of the Dublin Regulation was to ensure that the EU member state in which a migrant requested asylum was the state that was legally compelled to process that application. In theory, it meant that it was meant to prevent multiple applications by immigrants or their shuttlecocking between states. In practice, the Dublin Regulation put the onus on the southern states. Given that the boatloads of people with or without documentation were arriving to claim asylum in Italy or Greece rather than Holland or Germany, the Dublin Regulation gave countries like Italy or Greece only a few potential options. They could feel com impelled to process the asylum applications of every migrant who landed. Or they could encourage migrants not to apply for asylum where they landed, but instead push them to head north to find their way to other member states, applying for asylum once there. As of Dublin 3, which came into force in 2013, the country where fingerprints and asylum claims are stored is the state compelled to see through the asylum process and offer asylum. With thousands of people arriving in southern Europe every day, by the time this iteration came in it seems extraordinary that the northern states seriously expected the southern states not to try to find ways to get around this commitment. One way in which they did so was by ensuring that the country of arrival did not take the fingerprints of all the new arrivals. If they did so, then they would be compelled to see through the rest of the process and potentially offer that asylum. Far easier to push migrants north, undocumented, unfingerprinted, and unidentified. The number of people this happened to is unknown and unknowable, but frontline workers privately admit to it happening all the time. So, Dublin 3, which was meant to make the process clearer, in practice incentivized states to not participate in the system at all. What is more, migrants coming in 2015 knew that if they gave their fingerprints, they would have to stay in the country they were in, and so the migrants increasingly refused to provide them. The Italian and Greek authorities could not force them to do so, and as the flow increased, both migrants and southern states had similar reasons not to follow the procedures. If a migrant had expressed a desire to head to Northern Europe, it was better for Greece and Italy not to fingerprint them than to do so. Otherwise, both migrant and country of arrival would have forced another asylum procedure in a country that did not want them and where the migrant did not want to be. The Dublin Regulation, like the Schengen Agreement, turned out to be appealing when migration into the continent was at what had by then become normal levels but they were catastrophic when migration became the biblical phenomenon it turned into in 2015. Everywhere, feelings seemed to be overriding reality. The German chancellor, who only a few months earlier had explained to the Lebanese girl that politics was hard, was reported to have been touched by a group of Albanians, Syrians, Syrians and Iraqis filmed at the train station in Budapest on the 1st of September as they shouted, Germany, Germany, Merkel, Merkel. Later, as she went to greet arriving migrants in person, Merkel smiled, looking relaxed and happy as she posed for selfies with them taken on camera phones. By then, there were numerous possible routes into Europe. From Greece, migrants would travel through Macedonia and then north on up through Serbia. Through Serbia, they could either keep going straight north through Hungary and then Austria, and Austria until finally arriving in Germany, or make it to the same destination by growing through Bosnia, Croatia, Slovenia, and Austria. Those hoping to travel from Italy to Germany or the nor northern European states had the choice of either heading out of Italy by moving north and then west, past Genoa, through Ven Ventimiglia, and then other routes along the coast of France. Or they could go to the other side of Italy and cross the Italian-Austrian border. By early September of 2015, the Hungarian authorities, among others, announced that they were overwhelmed by the numbers encouraged to come and declared the situation in their country to be out of control. The Hungarian government tried to prevent the influx by stopping trains from leaving Hungary for Germany. Around 14,000 people were arriving in Munich each day. Over the course of a single weekend, 40,000 new arrivals were expected. The German Chancellor had her deputy spokesperson announce that Germany would not turn refugees away, and so the migrants headed off on foot along the motorways and train tracks of Hungary. The world watched as huge columns of mainly male migrants surged up through Europe. It was then, during the autumn of 2015, that the European dream of a borderless continent began to end. Having spent decades bringing the borders of Europe down for Europeans, 
the influx of this unknown number of non-Europeans meant that the borders of Europe began to go back up again. Hungary, among other states, was singled out for criticism by the German Chancellor and the heads of the EU for appearing to revert back to national boundaries. But the country had been under a considerable strain not of its own making. In 2013, it had registered around 20,000 asylum seekers. In 2014, that number doubled to 40,000. During the first three months of 2015, Hungary had more people arrive in the country than in the whole of the previous year. By the end of the year, the police had registered around 400,000 people. These migrants, almost all heading to Germany or Scandinavia, were entering Hungary from Serbia or Croatia at the rate of up to 10,000 a day. Most of them were people who had come through Greece and who should have been registered there. Hungarian authorities believed that perhaps 1 in 10 of the total number of people moving into their territory had been registered in the correct way in Greece. As the Hungarians saw it, the Greeks had simply failed to comply with the Schengen Agreement and EU law. By July, the Hungarian government had begun constructing a protective fence along the Serbian border. This meant that the flow along the Croatian border increased, and so they constructed another fence along that one. The flow then moved further along, concentrating on the Slovenian border. These fences hundreds of kilometers long were the only way in which the Hungarian government could stem the numbers. They were roundly condemned by the Austrian government, among others, yet soon everybody was at it. In August, Bulgaria began building a new fence along its border with Turkey. In September, Austria imposed controls on its border with Hungary, while Germany temporarily introduced controls at its border with Austria. When the German interior minister, Thomas de Maizier, announced on September, September 13th that his country would reintroduce border controls, nobody seemed to know who he was speaking for. Even people within the German government seemed to be aghast at what their chancellor had set in motion. In the middle of September, Hungary declared a state of emergency and closed its border with Austria. Then Croatia closed its border with Serbia. Soon, Austria began the construction of a barrier along its border with Slovenia. How was this Austrian fence different from what the Hungarians had put up? According to a shame-faced Austrian government, the difference was that their border fence was a door with sides. Soon Slovenia was constructing a fence along its border with Croatia, while Macedonia began constructing a barrier along its border with Greece. By this point, the European Commission itself was urging the Macedonian authorities to seal their border with Greece on behalf of the entire European Union, effectively forcing Greece unilaterally out of the Schengen area. Every action in Berlin set off a chain reaction across the continent. The arrival of hundreds of thousands of people, many of whom had no way to provide for themselves, had wholly predictable consequences. Some of them were, some were practical, how to house, clothe, and feed all these new arrivals. In Germany, the government began to threaten the owners of empty buildings with state-enforced requisition unless they were rented out to the government to house the migrants. Across the wider continent, there is a growing concern about who the people coming actually were. Hungarian officials estimated that around half of their arrivals in early 2015 were from the Western Balkans, notably Kosovo. Like everywhere else, most of the migrants had no papers. Around half of those waiting at Kaledi Railway Station in Budapest claimed to be Syrian, but officials and volunteers who asked them questions about Syria often discovered that they knew little or nothing about the country. Again, as with everywhere else, the vast majority of people, always more than 60%, were young men. Even Chancellor Merkel appeared to be now worrying about what she had set in motion. Both she and President Hollande of France, of France pushed ahead with the only solution that could take some of the growing pressure off Germany. The two of them, with the European Commission, attempted to persuade every member of the EU to take in a quota of migrants. Yet from Britain to Hungary, the member states refused. One reason they did so was that they could see that the numbers they were being asked to take did not reflect the actual figures. The European Commission and Merkel were trying to persuade countries to sign up to a quota system that was already inadequate for dealing with the numbers which had arrived. Governments that were refusing to do the bidding of Merkel and the European Commission were also reflecting the will of their people. A solid two-thirds of Hungarians polled during this period felt that their government was doing the right thing in refusing to agree to quota numbers issued from Brussels or Berlin. And yet, one of Hungary's most famous sons disagreed. 
The billionaire financier George Soros spent considerable sums of money during 2015 on pressure groups and institutions making the case for open borders and free movement of migrants into and around Europe. As well as a website called Welcome to EU, his Open Society Foundation published millions of leaflets informing migrants of what to do. These informed them of how to get into Europe, what their rights were once there, and what the authorities could and could not do. The group openly advocated resistance against the European border regime. In October 2015, the Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban criticized Soros publicly as one of a circle of activists who supports anything that weakens nation-states. Soros responded publicly to confirm that the numerous groups he was funding were indeed working for the ends described by Orban. In an email to Bloomberg, Soros said that it was, it was his foundation which was seeking to uphold European values, while he accused Orban of trying to undermine those values. Soros went on to say of Orban, quote, His plan treats the protection of national borders as the objective and the refugees as an obstacle. Our plan treats the protection of refugees as the objective and national borders as the obstacle, end quote. The dialogue ceased before anyone could ask Soros how long those European values might last once Europe could be walked into by people from all over the world. But then the argument changed. The media across the globe were already describing Europe as buckling under the strain of the new arrivals when, on the evening of Friday the 13th November, Paris was rocked by three hours of coordinated terrorist attacks. Gunmen in a car using assault rifles drove by and shot at Parisians as they were eating and drinking in bars and restaurants. At the same time, a suicide bomber, a suicide bomber struck at the Stade de France Stadium in Saint-Denis, where President Hollande was among the crowd watching a football game. As well as further shootings and suicide bombings at more restaurants, three gunmen entered the Bataclan Theater Concert Hall on the Boulevard Voltaire. While more than a thousand people were listening to a heavy metal concert, the attackers started firing assault rifles and gunned down as many as they could. They lined up the wheelchair users in the disabled section of the theater and shot... Oh, my God. Okay, this is just an uh, eyewitness report. By the end of the evening in Paris, 129 people had been killed and many hundreds more were wounded. Oh my God. The Islamic State in Syria claimed responsibility for the attacks. As with every previous terrorist attack in Europe, the continent held its breath and pondered the worst-case scenario. In time, it transpired that the culprits were from France and Belgium, but after the attack, one of the ringleaders had been able to safely return to Belgium. Of equal significance was that one of the Stade de France suicide bombers had a fake Syrian passport in the name Ahmad al-Mohammad. Officials admitted that a person of this name had entered Europe as an asylum seeker the month before the attacks. Fingerprints turned out to match a man who had been using that name to enter Greece in October. The person using the name had been picked up by Greek coast guards at the beginning of that month on a sinking boat filled with 70 other migrants. In November, he appeared to have traveled from the Isle of Leros through Serbia, Croatia, Austria, and Hungary, and finally to Saint-Denis. Although the news emerged exceptionally slowly, by the year after the attack it was clear that the majority of the Paris attackers, including the ringleaders, had not only been to Syria to receive terrorist training, but had slipped in and out of Europe easily while posing as migrants. Any public appetite for such porous external borders began to diminish. So too, once the news of the terrorist cells' free movements in and out of France on the night of the attack, did the appetite for an entirely borderless continent within Europe. Yet two days after the Paris attacks, Jean-Claude Juncker insisted at a press conference in Antalya, Turkey, quote, there are no grounds to revise Europe's policies on the matter of refugees, end quote. He went on to explain that the Paris attackers were criminals, not refugees or asylum seekers, adding, quote, I invite those in Europe who tried to change the migration agenda we adopted. I would like to remind them to be serious about this and not to give in to these basic reactions which I do not like, end quote. Whether he liked it or not, public and political attitudes were shifting. If the advantages for a Parisian heading to Brussels for the night had always been obvious, people were now also recognizing the risks of a system that allowed a Belgian Muslim to head for Paris for the evening and return home the same night, unharassed. The Paris attacks accelerated a process of swift reversal that was already underway. Norway hastily began to change its asylum policy 
And within a fortnight of the events in Paris, even Sweden announced that it would henceforth be introducing checks at its borders. From now on, people entering the country would need to show some form of identification. This was announced as though nobody had ever heard of such a thing before. As Sweden's Deputy Prime Minister Asa Romsen of the Green Party made this announcement, she broke down in tears. For his part, President Hollande announced that France was at war at home and abroad. The country immediately stepped up its bombing campaign, campaign against ISIS positions within Syria. But the abroad part was the easy bit. The home part was the trouble. A state of emergency was immediately declared and continued indefinitely. In the aftermath of the attacks, the French police carried out 168 raids in two days across the country. A raid in Lyon turned up a rocket launcher. A raid in Saint-Denis culminated in a woman blowing herself up with a suicide vest. One of the Bataclan bombers turned out to live in the shadow of Chartres Cathedral. As in the aftermath of the previous January's attacks on the offices of Charlie Hebdo and the kosher supermarket, French politicians were aware that this was a moment when there was a specific security concern on voters' minds. But they were also aware that the French public might well be dwelling on deeper issues to do with how their country had ever arrived at such a situation. Less than a fortnight after the attacks, Manuel Valls, the French prime minister, said that France would not accept more than 30,000 asylum seekers over the next two years. After a meeting with Chancellor Merkel in Paris, Valls pointedly announced, quote, it was not France that said to come, end quote. Whereas Chancellor Merkel continued to insist on the importance of sticking to a quota system for each country, Mr. Valls told journalists, quote, we cannot accommodate any more refugees in Europe. That's not possible, end quote. His office later said that there had been an error in translation, and he had intended to say that Europe could no longer take so many refugees. As in Britain and other European countries, the French public were right to be skeptical of such rhetoric and pronouncements. On everything to do with immigration and integration, they had heard the same thing for decades. As the percentage of the population that was foreign-born continued to grow every year, French politicians like their counterparts across the continent had competed to sound tougher than each other on the matter. Throughout the 1970s and 80s, Valérie Giscard d'Estaing, Fr François Mitterrand, and their colleagues had vied with each other to sound as though they were each more stern than the other on these issues. In 1984, Jacques Chirac, then the mayor of Paris, had publicly warned, quote, When you compare Europe with the other continents, it's terrifying. In demographic terms, Europe is disappearing. Twenty or so years from now, our countries will be empty, and no matter, now, no matter what our technological power, we will be incapable of putting it to use. In 1989, it was Socialist Prime Minister Michel Ricard who said in a television interview on the matter of asylum that France could not welcome all the misery of the world. Ricard went on to boast of the number of people he said his government had turned away and vainly promised more expulsions in the years ahead. Just like Mitterrand before him, Ricard played what was by then a clever electoral maneuver of the French left ahead of elections. All these pronouncements were part of a political game. Few of them had any impact in reality. In 1985, when Jean Raspail and Gerard de Mont had written their piece asking what France would look like in 2015, the French left under François Mitterrand was in disarray. It moved, its move from highly socialist to more free market economic policies had been a political disaster, alienating the unionized class who formed their largest constituency. The left was already fractured between the socialists and Jarn Marquez's communists, and in the run-up to the 1986 parliamentary elections, it looked as though under the Fifth Republic's electoral system, the left would be unable to win. President Mitterrand's experience as a minister in the Fourth Republic had trained him in electoral maneuvering, and so in the mid-1980s, he formulated a plan to neuter the right and capture the presidency in the 1988 election. The plan consisted of getting the Socialist Parliament to pass a new electoral law based on proportional representation and ensuring that immigration became a huge issue. At this moment, Jean-Marie Le Pen and his anti-immigration National Front Party proved exceptionally helpful to Mitterrand, who ensured that Le Pen, who had previously been kept to the far farthest margins, was given as much exposure as possible. For the first time, Le Pen began to get regular interviews to appear on television and was encouraged to air his views. The flip side was that a socialist or organized anti-racist movement, Touche pas à mon poté, would also be given maximum exposure, 
In the process, Mitterrand arranged that a damaged left created a damaged right. He knew that the National Front could only hurt the right and cause votes to run the other way, and that no party of the right could ever form an alliance with the National Front or even now dare to move closer to the National Front's line on immigration, national identity, and patriotism. If they did so, Mitterrand knew that they would be branded as fascists, racists, and betrayers of the values of the Republic. Mitterrand's plan worked so well in 1986 and 88 that it remained the strategy of the left throughout the years that followed. In each election, a strong showing for the National Front remained the best way to keep the right out of power and to ensure that the right could do little more than nod to concerns on immigration and identity without becoming toxic. All the while, Mitterrand and his successors on the left stressed how tough they were going to be on immigration. Yet, all the time, the migrant communities of France grew in numbers. Eventually, politicians of the mainstream right also tried to make their names by sounding tough on immigration. In 1993, while a minister with responsibility for immigration, Charles Pascal had announced that France would close its borders and that France would become a zero-immigration country. In 1993, he boasted of forthcoming crackdowns on illegal immigrants, quote, When we have sent home several plane loads, even boat loads and train loads, the world will get the message, end quote. But it is doubtful that he believed this, even at the time, continuing, quote, The problems of immigration are ahead of us and not behind us, he said, end quote, acknowledging that in the not-too-distant future, the tens of millions of young people in Africa who were without a future would be likely to want to head north. The French political debate throughout these years was both, was both unique and utterly representative in Europe. Throughout those decades, in lieu of being able to deal with the larger issues thrown up by mass migration, the main parties of Western Europe concentrated on small, symbolic issues. Sometimes it was a boast. Sometimes it was a specially prepared crackdown on illegal migrants. The thinking appeared to be that such issues would not only allow the politicians to look as though they were being especially tough on something, but would release a certain amount of public steam. The secular tradition of France made debates over how people dressed into particular touchstone issues. So it was that the first headscarf debate in France emerged in 1989 when schoolgirls in the sound of Creole in the north of Paris began to wear the headscarf to school and were banned from doing so by the school. In the ensuing debate, the government of the day recommended that it was up to individual schools to decide on a policy toward headscarves. The matter returned in the 2000s when the growing visibility of the headscarf in French society and the need for government to be seen to be doing something led President Chirac in 2004 to pass a law forbidding the wearing of conspicuous religious symbols in public buildings. The French state had not reached the decision to ban such symbols in public schools or courts because of greater numbers of French Jews wearing kippahs and Christians wearing small crosses on their necklaces. Rather, they reached this decision based on the increase in veiled women appearing in public. Recognizing that the growth of the wearing of the headscarf symbolized an upsurge in conservative Muslim sentiment wherever it occurred, the French government drew the line, firmly, to try to stop a trend and decided that tangling up all other religions with it was a worthwhile sacrifice. Several years later, in 2009, the people of Switzerland put down what they regarded as a worthwhile marker in a similar vein. The constitutional amendment that passed a ban on minaret construction in the country was put to a plebiscite by the Swiss government and approved by 57.5% to 42.5%. The following year, Chirac's successor, Nicolas Sarkozy, had an opportunity to make full face coverings into an issue. A bill was passed in 2010 that made it illegal to wear a full full face covering in public places such as streets and shopping centers. Finally, in the summer of 2016, a number of French towns banned the wearing of the so-called burkini on their beaches. Although the country's highest administrative court suspended the ban, the issue of the burkini dominated the news of August 2016. One of the town halls to ban the garment, which exposes the face, though not the body, was Nice. In its way, this was a distillation of the French solution to the questions thrown up by a mass immigration. A month before the Burkini ban in Nice, a Tunisian called Mohamed Lohaja Bouel drove a truck into the crowds on the seafront as the people celebrated Bastille Day. Eighty-six people were killed that evening on the Promenade des Anglais, and many more were wounded 
ISIS subsequently claimed that the terrorists had carried out the attack in a response to their call to carry out such attacks anywhere in Europe. The French government once again extended the state of emergency that had been in place in the country since the previous November, but it was typical that in the weeks after such an atrocity, the, the loudest public debate was about an item of Islamic swimwear that had only been invented a decade earlier. It was tempting to get hooked on such comparative minutia because all the bigger questions had become unanswerable. You may be able to stop people getting hold of Kalashnikovs, but how do you stop them getting a hold of trucks? And you may stop more extremists coming into your country, but what do you do with extremists who are already your citizens? Thank you for watching. Please like, subscribe, and visit my channel for more exciting content.